Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 7th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcasts of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, in our view, why those resisting other taxes are prolonging PFD cuts. Second, a big step from Monday's PFD working group meeting. And third, the university regents blink and revert yet again to 2016. And now, Let's join Michael. The weekly top three. We've uh, we we're we I feel like we're kind of beating a dead horse here, but I think that there's some people who have not been having this conversation. Um, the number one thing, which I, I just want to touch on from yesterday, we had uh, Senator Mike Shower on, and he was echoing uh, echoing some of the same things that you and I have been talking ca- talking about, including your number one, which is why those resisting other taxes are prolonging the PFD cuts. He yesterday said we needed to look at new revenues, including some form of taxation, because otherwise the PFD was going to disappear. And um, and it sounds like there are a few people who are coming around to that way of thinking. Let's, uh, let's take off with number one here. Well, Michael, in the past week or couple of weeks, I've been having a number of exchanges with people who have moved to the position that okay, maybe at some point we need taxes, but but the state has to demonstrate that they have their fiscal house in order uh, before we before we have those taxes. And that's a very frustrating discussion for me. I mean, maybe maybe Senator Shower said the same thing yesterday. But what's very frustrating about it is we have had taxes the last four years. PFD cuts are taxes. and 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 the level of those taxes is growing. Each year, we've had a higher amount of the PFD um, uh, revenues, revenues intended for the PFD, taken by government uh, than the year before. Uh, This year, we're up to $900 million of of what otherwise would be the statutory PFD that's been diverted diverted to government. We have taxes. And when you look ahead, I mean, I... I, I, I spend a lot of time and and I and I no doubt bore you and others by spending a lot of time at looking at these at these 10 year forecasts. But when you look when you when you look at the 10 year forecast and look ahead, we continue to, to, to run deficits. I mean, even if even if we went back to 19, uh, 2000 spending levels, which is what the governor's original budget did. Uh, we had it escalated for inflation, but 2006 spending levels escalated for inflation. We had a $400 million deficit starting out uh, this year, and we saw what happened to the governor's budget. I mean, his initial budget was $400 million in deficit, and by we by the time we, we ended up going through the first round of, uh, or the legislature acted on that, and then we had the first round of vetoes, and the legislature acted on that, and the second round of vetoes, we ended up, compared to a full statutory PFD, we ended up with a deficit somewhere in the eight hundred dollar or eight hundred million dollar range. Right. So we, we're we're there. There is not a cuts only option, viable cuts only option out there. And every year, every every budget that somebody says, "Oh, we'd be we we're, we're we'll get ready for taxes once the state gets its fiscal house in order." Every year we go through that, we have another round of PFD cuts to to finance the deficit. I say I say in some of these exchanges with people that the, the top 20% is laughing all the way to the bank. I mean, every year we have PFD cuts, the, the top 20% is paying virtually nothing. Non-residents are paying nothing. Um, and, and the bulk of the, of the spending or the bulk of the cost is being shoved off on middle and lower income Alaska families. They love this situation. 
And so talking about, well, we'll we'll address some form of equitable taxes once we get our fiscal house in order. We aren't going we aren't getting our fiscal house in order, and frankly, we aren't going to get our fiscal house in order until we have an equitable approach to taxation that includes the top 20 percent and 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 gives the top 20 percent creates an incentive for the top 20 percent to be concerned about government spending as well. Right, and arguably, of course, as you said, they're laughing all the way to the bank. They are uh, they are purposefully. Uh, you know, putting and and misleading everybody on this, knowing that that top twenty that uh, that 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 PFD cut is a tax. That that's how they're funding government, and they know that they are essentially skating on it as a percentage of their income. You've done the breakdown, right? It's less than two percent. I mean, the PFD cuts are less than two percent for the top twenty percent. They are five, eight, uh, up to twenty percent uh, for the remaining income brackets. Uh, by the time you get down to the lowest 20%, they're more than 20% of uh, the, the PFD cuts have been more than 20% of the lowest uh, 20% income. So yeah, the top 20% and, and non-residents are making out like crazy. They're keeping money that they otherwise, they're keeping money in their bank accounts and in their investment accounts that otherwise would pay for their proportionate share of the cost of government. They're keeping that money in their accounts while middle and lower income Alaska families are giving up that money in terms of PFD cuts uh, to, p- to pay for government. The only way we're going to get this situation under control is for all Alaskans to have to, to have the same skin in the game and for all Alaskans to be looking at how to cut government spending. The top 20 percent is not doing that because they're not having to pay any appreciable share, a, a trivial amount. Uh, of their income toward the cost of government. And each year that we keep going down this road uh, and saying, oh, we're going to put off taxation, other taxation until we get our fiscal house in order, each year we keep going down this road is just another year of PFD cuts. It, it's a it's a very frustrating situation to deal with people who take that position because, you know, a, a lot of them are well-meaning. A lot of them are well-intentioned. I don't, I don't, you know, claim that they're rogue agents for the top 20%, but they're doing the top 20%'s bidding. They're, they, they are in effect, when they say that, when they say um, uh, that, oh, we'll, we'll get around to considering other taxation once we get our fiscal house in order, they, in a sense, are, are advocating PFD cuts because without some other revenue source um, and, and recognizing that the cuts on, there isn't a cuts-only option on the table, Without some other revenue source, each year we keep going down this trail, just like's happened the last, the last, the three before this, and then this year is the fourth. Each year we keep going down this trail. We're just going to continue to have be funding government from PFD taxes. Well, and I think that again, some people are starting to come around and understand this. That there's just not the political. I mean, I think if the governor had his way, we probably would would get there. If he had his way, and he was the only one in the room making the decision. But again, even the governor, with his quote-unquote draconian apocalyptic cuts that he had at the beginning of last year, was still nearly half a billion dollars out of balance. He was half a billion dollars into the red and uh, and still would have been short in year one. Now, maybe he would have fixed it in year two. Maybe he could have gone all the way if he was alone. But he can't. He's got to convince 60 other people that he's right, and we've seen how that's turned out. Well, he's got con- he's got to convince at least sixteen, right? Right. He's got to convince sixteen to 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 hold with him on 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 these veto cuts uh, and to, and to uphold the vetoes. And he didn't have sixteen at, at, by the by the last round. Of, the reason that we that that the government uh, restored uh, funding to the Arts Council, the reason that uh, that the 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 University of Alaska cuts, which were one hundred and thirty million at the beginning. Uh, of the of the budget cycle ended up at 25 this year and 20 and 20 next year half of the governor's cuts and now spread over three years as opposed to as opposed to occurring in one year the, the reason that all of that occurred is because there weren't 16 in the legislature who were willing to stand by the governor governor on these vetoes the most frustrating thing that I that that you know some of the the most frustrating uh, discussions I've had is with those those same legislators who said, oh, we've got to restore uh, arts council, we've got to restore best beginnings, we can't cut uh, the university that deeply, and then they say, um, but but we're not ready for we're not ready for taxes yet. Um, 
they're they're the they're the ones that are leading us right into this continuation of PFD taxes, um, and it's 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 it, it is it is in, massively inconsistent to say for them to say and for others to say, oh, I can't I can't support you know all the cuts that the governor made. We need to we need to go uh, uh, slower on this, or we need to maintain funding for these things. Massively inconsistent to say that, and then at the same time say. And I'm and I'm again, you know, I'm, I'm not ready for 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 other taxes yet, because all they're doing is they are in essence supporting continued PFD cuts. Well, which leads us into uh, our number two uh, uh, of the weekly top three. I mean, I think we we've we've hit that hard, and and I don't know uh, why anybody else can't see this at this point. That we at least need to have this discussion. I guess my final thought on number one is again, it echoes what Hammond said when he warned against eliminating the income tax. Now, <clears throat> I wasn't necessarily a fan. I was pretty young, but looking back, I wasn't a huge fan of the way we had income taxes before. I believe a flat tax, uh, along with you, is probably the most equitable. But his fear was if we took away the uh, income tax, that Alaskans would become disconnected from their government as far as budgets were concerned, and I think that that has proven true. And uh, and I think that that is uh, that is a prime example of that. Um, it, it, it is, and, and PFD cannot, BF, PFD cuts have reconnected to some degree, reconnected middle and lower income Alaska families. The problem is the donor class, the ones that drive state policy, the top twenty percent uh, aren't connected, aren't reconnected to to Alaska spending because using PFD cuts they're able to avoid they're able to avoid paying any significant share. So we need to find a way to reconnect. We reconnected middle and lower income Alaska families, but we need to we need to reconnect top the top twenty percent as well to to the cost of government and and get them engaged, create an incentive for them to become engaged uh, to, uh, to 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 push back on 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 the spending levels that we have. Yep. As a mid-income earner, Catherine says, we aren't as affected. It hurts to see low income get so grossly affected. A few making impact, a few making impacting decisions are the most definitely in the top uh, top top twenty percent, and are gloating. However, and I and I think that's the truth. I think that they're completely ignoring this whole scenario, Brad. Uh, and 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 the thing that I find most callous about all these discussions over the last three or four years is the just the just totally ignoring the economic impact of it. I mean this is the same group of people that demanded that everything that the governor did with his budget had to show what the impact was, what the effect was. They wanted to see what the not just the primary, they wanted to see secondary and tertiary effects as well, but they refused to acknowledge the impact of the taxing of that PFD. Yeah, it's really that's that's a great point, Michael. When, when you do taxes, when you do revenue measures, you always, always, always worry about the distributional effects. You worry about whether you're being fair uh, between income classes, whether you're taxing one income class uh, more than another. And usually those distributional effects, on when, when you're talking about a progressive income tax, usually the people who want to see those distributional effects are the, are the top 20 percent, top 10 percent, top 5 percent who are being taxed significantly more, and they want to show the distributional effects uh, of those tax. The, 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 the legislature had a full-scale, full-on distributional analysis done in 2017 when they were talking about a variety of taxes uh, at that time. But you can't find one mention of the distributional impacts um, uh, since the 2017 session. We went through the entire session last year talking about PFD cuts, talking about the depth of PFD cuts. Senator Von Imhoff was out there saying it ought to just be whatever the remainder is. Uh, after government take, get, gets finished taking all it wants for spending, the PFD ought to be the remainder. Not one breath, um, either either from the members of the committee or from Ledge Finance, which, which was doing the analysis of, of all these impacts, uh, not one breath about the distributional impact uh, across across income classes, and that's just you, you just don't find that. I mean, I've talked to to friends I have who do this sort of work uh, at the at the national level, who do it in other states, um, and I'm describing what's going on out here and the fact we aren't doing distributional Im impacts, and it's just sort of their jaw hits the floor because uh, because they're just I mean they're shocked that we're not that we're not considering the distributional impacts, and and it's and, and it's for a very simple reason. 
the top 20% is in, in control of the legislature, they're control, in control of the Senate Finance Committee and the House Finance Committee, and they don't want people to see the distribu distributional impacts. They don't want, a people, want people to understand how regressive uh, uh, using a PFD tax to raise funds is. Right, exactly. And that's the thing. But, and again, asking at the same time for analysis from the governor for every little thing that was changed. Uh, again, it is, in my opinion, the height of uh, hypocrisy. Uh, Representative Ben Carpenter's in the chat room. He says, given this argument, we don't have a revenue problem. We have a de facto flat tax now with the use of the permanent fund earnings, except for the whole flat part of that representative because again we're i mean you're talking about a flat tax is is ideally a percentage of given income across the across all the income streams that's really kind of the definition of it am i am i wrong here brad no you're exactly right that 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 misinterprets what a flat tax is i mean taxes are either progressive regressive or or flat progressive means it's a higher percentage uh, the higher up in the income bracket you go, regressive is a lower percent or a higher percentage. The lower the, the the lower in the income bracket you go, so that lower income um, um, brackets pay more than higher income brackets. Brackets that's what the PFD tax is, and then a flat tax is an equal percentage across. What 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 some people when they when they say the PFD is a flat tax, it, it's not. It's a head tax. Governor Hammond talked about this. It's a tax per head. It's a tax per person. That's not a flat tax. That ultimately turns into a regressive tax because you're taxing lower income Alaskans the same amount of money, not the same percentage, but the same amount of money as you're taxing upper income Alaskans. That turns into a regressive tax. So, no, we don't have a flat tax now. What we have is a head tax, uh, which is a regressive tax uh, that hits middle and lower income families uh, the hardest. Christine says, we don't have a money problem in Alaska. We have a spending problem. Quit asking taxpayers to give up more of their money, please. The problem is, and I agree with everything that you just said there, Christine, the problem is is that they're framing the narrative, they're pushing the discussion, and even with the best hope of everything, we're still in the hole. Welcome back to the program, The Michael Duke Show, Common Sense Radio. We're dealing uh, with the weekly top three. We're talking with Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, who is not winning any friends and influencing people right now uh, amongst uh, amongst some of the listeners who are basically saying, no, 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 we've got to continue to cut our way uh, out of this um, and when we should be able to do it. Uh, and while theoretically, yes, we should be able to do it, Again, we could see where the rubber meets the road. And before we jump into number three, Brad, I guess we just, again, I need to do the roundup one more time of saying there's a difference between theoretical and practical. And the political reality is we do not have enough support in this state, even amongst all the conservatives, quote unquote, uh, including the faithful 15 and friends and all that to make these cuts happen. Exactly right. The governor's initial budget. L listen to these numbers. The governor's initial budget was $400 million in the red. $400 million in the red. That was the governor's initial budget. By the time the legislature got finished with it, we went through the first round of vetoes, and, the, and, and then the legislature dealt with those, and then we went through the second round of vetoes. We were $850 million in the red. We were double in the red. We were in the red all the way through. The reason we are we were in the red at the end, and we were higher in the red than we were even at the beginning of the governor's uh, of the budget cycle, was because there weren't 16 willing to stand by the governor for those those additional vetoes. I mean, we can all say, as 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 many times during the day as we want, that ah, oh, there's a there's a cuts only option out there, and we're going and we're going to find it. We aren't finding it. We didn't find it this past legislature. Now the governor's saying it's a it's a three year plan as opposed to a one year plan. We are not finding the cuts only option, and every year we don't. The last four, every year we don't. What's happening is we're getting PFD taxes. That's going to continue. When you say we're going to continue to press for a cuts only option, we aren't going to support any other taxes. When you say that, you are in effect supporting PFD cuts. Continue PFD cuts. And, and I may be unpopular in saying that, but it's the truth. Right. And people need to understand that's exactly what's going on. The top 20% is laughing all the way to the bank. 
they're not having to pay any significant taxes. The taxes, PFD taxes are pushed mostly off on middle and lower income Alaska families. That's the direction we've gone the last four years. Even the governor's budget didn't, didn't, didn't get us back into balance without some sort of new revenue source. That's the direction we're going to continue to go. We either find a revenue source that treats all Alaskans fairly, including the top 20 percent, or we're going to continue to go down this road each year of using PFD cuts to, uh, uh, to, to, to close the budget gap. Let's move on to number two. Number two in this scenario is, of course, the PFD itself. And Monday there was a working group that met uh, in uh, downtown Anchorage. They wanted to come up with some ideas. Uh, KTUU had the story on it, and it was kind of interesting to read. That is your number two on your weekly top three. Yeah, the, 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 the working group session hasn't gotten the press I think it deserved. KT, KTUU uh, ran the only story, frankly, that I've been able to find on it, and they buried the lead. Uh, the, the, there, was a, there was a big thing that happened uh, at, uh, at the Monday meeting, uh, and I don't, I don't think people appreciate, uh, appreciate its significance. Shelley Hughes, who is a member of the uh, of the working group, uh, one of the three Senate uh, Republic or one of the three senators uh, on the working group, uh, came out and said that she was uh, she had been re- she had been thinking about this issue, um, and 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 came out in support of a 50-50 PFD based upon the POMV, essentially taking the POMV, the 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 percent of market value uh, take off of the permanent fund. And dividing that 50-50 between uh, between government and dividends, that's a big deal. Uh, that 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 shift toward the middle, if you will, um, is a big deal. Uh, taking that position, agreeing to 50-50 PMV, POMV, as opposed to the the current statute, would free up about 500 million, 400 to 500 million dollars uh, over the course of 10 years. Uh, annually over the course of 10 years, average over the course of 10 years, 400 to 500 billion dollars um, uh, toward government revenue. We'd push that toward government revenue. It would decrease the PF, the amount currently going to the PFD. I don't think it's unfair uh, the amount that that would increase the, the, the PFD. I've written articles in the past why I think POMV 5050 is the right approach, but there's been a lot of resistance to POMV 5050 in the past. Shelley Hughes's movement toward that. Uh, I think is is a big deal. I think that's the highlight uh, out of the uh, out of the Monday working group session, and I think it's something that people need to be talking about positively um, uh, as as a result of that. And and I just don't think there's a there's that recognition yet what a big move that was. And uh, when I read that, I'll be honest with you, I was quite shocked because that that was a surprise to me. Uh, historically, she has been a um, <clears throat> statutory formula supporter, and that shifts a move, uh, you know, it signals a move. But again, uh, it seems like we're the ones that continue, we on the on the conservative side are the ones that seem to continually be moving to the middle while the other side continues to just hold their ground, stamp their feet, and say it's our way or the highway. Yeah, I think this really puts a lot of burden. It should put a lot of burden, and people should talk about this as putting a lot of burden on the top 20%. Okay, now you have the PFD supporters who are willing to move to POMV 5050, uh, uh, move funds over to the government side that that have been uh, on the statutory or on the PFD side, um, still preserve 5050, preserve Hammond's 5050, and I think I think it's consistent with Hammond's vision. Uh, we can talk about that sometime if it's a, if it's appropriate. I think POMV 5050 is still consistent with Hammond's vision, uh, but but making that move now, I think it's up to the top 20 percent. Uh, how greedy are you? <laughs> is basically the question. Are you gonna are you gonna continue to say, well, that's nice, but we want more, or is the top 20 percent gonna make a move uh, uh, toward the middle as well? And if they do, uh, there's a chance we can start getting to. A resolution of the of the state's fiscal situation, but but there 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 is there is more move to be made. Moving to, to POMV 5050 uh, does not close the fiscal gap. It still leaves a significant, given our spending levels, it still leaves a significant fiscal gap out there. The danger of moving to POMV 5050 
um, uh, is is that, that once you make that move, then we then we run another year of deficit as we will, and people say, well, it doesn't need to be 50-50, then it can be 25-75, and and you just start down this slippery slope. The top 20% needs to make a move now to match uh, what Senator Hughes has done uh, if we're gonna if we're gonna reach closure on this thing. But I think it's a big step on her part, uh, and I applaud her for taking that step uh, to 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 indicate that she's willing to move uh, toward uh, toward the middle on the issue. Um, I do want to touch on this briefly before we move on to number three. Uh, one of the comments in this, one of the, the statements in this article I, I want you to unpack for me quickly is, uh, and this is in the KTUU article on the working group uh, meeting, using the traditional statutory formula sees deficits rise above $1.7 billion in fiscal year 2025 and the state's main savings account drained by 2021. The PFD is projected to grow roughly $3,500 per person in 2022 and stay relatively stable for the next few years after that. Now, <clears throat> the, the permanent fund grows and takes those earnings and puts them in there, and it's always a percentage of rolling average. Can you explain how, and I'm assuming when they say state's main savings account, I'm assuming that they're meaning, well, I'm assuming they're meaning the CBR, the Constitutional Budget Reserve. But that's a little misleading because the dividend comes out of the ERA. Can you unpack that for us quickly here? Well, the CBR is already down to about $2 billion. Uh, and so continuing to spend um, uh, more than more than we have revenue uh, in requiring us to, to pull money from the savings account will drain the CBR fairly quickly. And by that point, uh, whatever whatever period of time it takes to drain two billion dollars, which is probably a couple more years, um, and then you're you're faced with if you want to continue that practice, you have to start pulling out of the ERA, essentially taking money that's intended for future Alaskans to create this fund for future Alaskans, taking money for current Alaskans, um, and and continue supporting the government uh, government that way. So it's it's it's. It, it, we're draining the same. I mean, we're continuing the same thing that we've been doing since 2014. We're just 2012. We're continuing to drain savings accounts uh, to support current spending by by not raising the revenues from ourselves I, and from I the do, current generation. Yeah, and I, I think what, uh, but I think this is also very misleading because I think it continues to say what they're doing is is essentially it, it plays into the argument that the PFD is government money that we're then spending out. I mean, I, I think. While may, maybe it's technically accurate, it's also a very misleading statement in saying that we, you know, we shouldn't have that money because it means that we're, we're taking dollars from the state in that regard. And, and I just see this as it, it is a very confusing issue for some people because they don't understand the mechanisms by which all this stuff is put together. I mean, ideally, we could have a $3,500 per person dividend. Uh, and uh, and a, a, a ba balanced budget, but it would require a flat tax to make all that happen. Yeah, it requires some revenue source. Right. I mean, what's hap what's happening now is they're using the PFD, they're taxing the PFD to make up to make up that revenue. Uh, if we don't have a substitute revenue source, then they will just con then the government will just continue <laughs> to tax the PFD through PFD cuts to make up the revenue. Well, and I think next week we're going to have to talk about this 50-50 POMV model and the, the, the differences between that and a statutory model uh, as well. I think we need to jump into that. But we're running out of time, so we need to get into our third, which, of course, was the big story from Monday. The University of Alaska Regents have said, decided to say thanks, but no thanks. They're no longer considering the consolidation issue. This, this is 2016 all over again. In, in, in 2016, the legislature instructed the university to evaluate going to a single university uh, and come back and report to the re, come back and report to the legislature. The university sort of started down that road, uh, but then it got all messed up um, and and really uh, various components of the university didn't want to seriously consider it. They pushed back on it, made it a confusing issue. Um, uh, and and ultimately, the university just sort of threw up its hands and says, "Well, we can't do that." Uh, and the and the and the the result of that, once the university sort of gave up on that, was the university then sort of turned around, and came came back to the legislature. Well, we're going to continue this model, and we need more money uh, to fund that model because we have, you know, we have and deferred maintenance, and we have you know, important programs we need to run. Uh, 
to fund all these campuses. And and we, we passed that in 2016 when there was a legislative effort to bring spending down. The university just turned it around and kept on going. It's almost exactly what we're going through right now. The, the legislature and the governor said, focus on consolidation. Let's go to consolidation. Let's get a university that we can afford, a good university that we can afford. The university started down that road, and now we're going into the, the mumbo-jumbo uh, period where universities, the University Board of Regents, there's a lot of pushback, and the University and Board of Regents throw up their hands and say, we can't do that. Um, and, 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 we're, and we're losing that momentum again, uh, just like we lost it in 2016. It doesn't doesn't portend good things. It doesn't pretend coming out of this with the cost savings that we need from the university. No, and it seems again, it seems to be just blindly turn, you know, staring into the face of the beast and then looking back at your partner and say, "Don't worry, nothing's wrong. It'll all work out." Which uh, I think is uh, obviously a big mistake. I mean, this has been recommended by several reports. It's been demanded by the legislature back in 2016. Uh, uh, the the president has said it's the way that they need to go, and yet everybody continues to say, no, nope, we, we just can't do that. I was talking with some people who've worked at the university. I was talking with one person who's worked there for 15 years, and uh, she said, uh, she said, yep, she goes, I'm leaving. She goes, this, this place is a total disaster. She said, watching the uh, fights, the infighting between the three chancellors, trying to consolidate and hold on to their power and do all that kind of stuff is just, it's insane. She goes, they're completely ignoring reality. And, uh, and, and she said, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a mess. It's, it's gotta be difficult to be Jim Johnson right now. The board, the board has good people on it. The board has people of, of goodwill, but they're turning into mush, uh, uh, during this process. Um, there were the, the, the chancellors have pushed back the students, you know, w- without good guidance from the leadership, the students are going, you know, what the heck's going on to us. We're getting left behind. Uh, there's been, people have reached out to the accreditation agency and the accreditation agency says you need to be listening to your constituents. Um, and, and, and so the board sort of did all of that and, and sort of threw its hands up in the air and said, yeah, we're going to go back to the beginning. We're going to, we're going to start this process all over again. Um, and, and we're going to, you know, do it from the outset again, the same thing they did in 2016, not only did the board stop the effort toward, um, a single university accreditation, but the, the, the consolidation, but the board stopped the effort, effort to evaluate various programs around the university, including the athletic programs. I right. mean, the board had started an effort to, to look into which programs should be kept, which programs could be consolidated, which programs could be. Uh, could be wound down. Which ones could be done by a lead by a lead campus, um, and and they backed off that effort uh, as well. The second motion uh, from last from earlier this week's meeting. So it's it, the board's just sort of turned into mush and 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 turned this whole process uh, into mush as, as as a result of that. We have got to get we have got to get to the point where we've got one university that we can fund well. And, and make that university a standout university. If we try to continue to go down this road where we've got three separate universities that we're funding, each of which is trying to outdo the other and, and working at cross purposes with the other and arguing with the other and saying, no, we can do this, you can't do that, or we need the money, you don't need the money. Uh, if we keep going down that road, we're gonna end up with three very mediocre universities, uh, each underfunded, relative to what it takes to have a good university. We can afford one. We need to focus our money on one. We need to focus our process on getting to that result. We need to listen to the, the chancellor, certainly. We need to listen to the students uh, in that process. But that's the, that's the end result we need to be driving toward. Um, and and the, the, the Board of Regents just totally blew up that process um, and sort of you know put us right back where we were before the governor started this whole process with his initial round of budgets. Do you want to uh, you want to take a guess at what you think the governor is going to do with this uh, once this comes back around? I mean, this was part of their fiscal agreement was that they would consider that consolidation. I mean, they've hand grenaded this less than thirty days after they've written that that agreement. I I think I hope that the governor will will 
will will stand up for 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 the continue down the road of consolidation. I hope the legislature will stand up for continued uh, progress down the road of, of legislation. Those who oppose it uh, or consolidation, those who oppose it are using this accreditation issue as sort of a front uh, to 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 say, oh, you got You can't do that. You got to start this process all over. You got to do it differently. That's not what the accreditation agency said. Uh, I've been through this personally at the University of Virginia, and we had an accreditation issue because of failure to, to consider. You need to listen to your constituents, but they don't drive the bus. You don't need your constituents don't drive the bus. It's sort of like an environmental impact statement, right? You need to consider all of the environmental impacts, but at the end, you make what's what's the best public policy decision. That's the same way that the that the board ought to be treating. Uh, uh, the the input from the uh, chancellors and from the uh, from the students they ought to be considering it just like you do an environmental impact statement giving due consideration but driving toward the end of making a strong university which is which is the single the single university plan so I it I, I hopefully the governor will continue to, to push forward hopefully he won't be um, uh, turned into mush on this process hopefully the legislature will continue to move forward um, uh, but right now it's just, it's a mess. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. You can find him out on Facebook. You can argue with him out on Facebook. He's happy to, uh, he's happy to have these discussions continuously with everybody on Facebook right now. It seems like, uh, and there's a lot of people who are pushing back on these ideas from Brad, uh, talking about this because, um, you know, they, they continue to say, you know, the, the, the cuts are, are the thing. Um, but, uh, I think that there's a, that, you know, again, there's a political reality and the political reality is we've got politicians that just will not support that idea. No matter how conservative they say they are, a lot of them are folding at the 11th hour. And that's, what's brought us to this position. Uh, one final thought, Brad, uh, Sandy asks, what do you think of the departure of Donna Arduin? Oh, I think it's a setback. I mean, Donna was, was a, was a strong advocate for cutting costs, identifying where they can be. Uh, we now have an interim OMB director uh, who is a technocrat, good technocrat, but but all they're doing is all that person's doing is gathering the budgets and sort of sort of putting them together. There's not a, there's not the same drive that that Donna brought uh, to uh, to the cost cutting effort, and I think that's a loss for the state. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets, go forth, my friend, and fight the good fight. And uh, you know you're gonna wear your fingers out on that keyboard, but uh, go to town with it, okay? Michael, thanks for having me. I appreciate you coming on board and joining us. Thank you very much. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week 